Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon, and then I post it up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. I would like to thank my sponsor, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. They're an online therapy company. They are all over the world. So if you need to get to a therapist, go to betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas, fill out a questionnaire. They will place you with a licensed professional master's level or PhD level in your state. So, uh, and, and, or if you're outside of the country, they will place you with somebody that can do international. So there is that. Hello everyone. Oh my. Okay. So, so much to talk about today. Um, I was laughing because right before I went on air, my, my little chime sounded on my phone or my computer for, you know, a message and, uh, lucky thought it was the doorbell. He goes tearing off to the door barking and I'm like, Oh no, now I've done it. Anyway, he's calmed down. It's all good. All right. So before we dive into today's topic, which is how rude dealing with strangers when they're abusive or when they're disordered or when they're just rude or when they're just being jack wagons. We're going to talk about that. First of all, I wanted to dive into current events. So again, Maui needs your help. Maui desperately needs your help. Please, please, please. If you can donate, please donate to a good uh, Hawaiian rescue thing. Um, I know there's a lot of scams. Dear God, there are so many scams out there. It's not even funny. So for me, Brenda Colas and I are donating to people that we know that live in, in Maui or that had houses there. Um, and we know them. So we're donating to them directly. Um, but find a, uh, uh, and Katie King is doing the same thing. Um, find a Hawaiian um, a charitable organization. Be careful of the scams. There are Man, they are fast and furious and they're pissing me off because it's like they're taking advantage of people that have been decimated. So anyway, if you can help, please, please, please donate and help them. They they don't have fresh water. Water's not safe to drink. Um, there's apparently, like I said, I knew this was going to happen. There's apparently the governor has had to step in and stop developers from trying to rook people out of their property, lowballing them. And, you know, hey, we know you're desperate here. Here's some cash. We'll take your land. You know, it, I knew that was going to happen. I knew it just, mm, where's my middle finger? If I could use my middle finger right now, I would. So um, anyway, just, you know, help as much as you can. So on that note, we've got Hurricane Hillary coming into Southern California. It just, it's just landed in uh, Baja. And um, here's the thing. We are going to have more and more extreme weather events, whether that's fire, hurricanes, flooding, et cetera, or drought. So flash droughts, that's also something that is happening. Um, so you want to get together a go kit. Now, here's the deal. This is going to benefit you in two ways. If you get together an emergency go kit, your abuser is none the wiser. Because you tell them it's an emergency go kit. And at the very, very bottom of it, you put all the things that you're going to need. Okay. You can do that. If you can't hide your go bag at a, a friend's house or at your work or whatever, if you're trapped in the house with this person, then you simply say, I am getting an emergency go kit together in case of earthquake, fire, flood, whatever. So when John and I lived in LA, I always carried an emergency bag with me in my car because of the earthquakes. And so I always had extra cash, credit cards, you know, on me and my purse, obviously, but extra cash, um, flashlight, water, ready to eat meals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, enough for at least three days. So, but that was back in the day. So um, I pulled up how to make an emergency go bag. Where did it go? Oh, dear God. Did I get rid of it? No, there it is. All right. So, um, and, and this would be good in case you need to bug out because of your abuser as well. And I would hide the money or the credit card or whatever it is that you're going to use at the very bottom, maybe in a shoe with a sock on top of it, you know, that kind of thing. So you're going to need non-perishable food, minimum of three days to one week supply. 
and a manual can opener. I think a lot of people forget that. You need four lot liters of water per person per day for drinking and sanitation. You're going to need a phone charger, um, battery powered or hand crank radio. This is for like, you know, weather emergencies, etc. Battery powered or hang, hand crank flashlight, extra batteries, first aid kit. This is huge. And medications, personal toiletries and items such as an extra pair of glasses or contacts. Um, copies of important documents such as insurance papers and identification, cash in small bills, garbage bags, moist towelettes, baby wipes, um, seasonal clothing, whether it's summer or winter, dust masks, especially if you're in an area where there's fire or dust storms or whatever, and a whistle. Um, that's for the emergency weather go bag. John is going to put that in the, um, in the chat. And then this is for, this next one is for, you know, a go bag to get away from an abusive relationship, birth certificates, social security cards for yourself and your children, copies of driver's license and or passports or the actual driver's license and or passports, especially for the kids, uh, marriage, divorce, or custody papers. Absolutely. Uh, legal protection or restraining orders, health insurance cards, medical records, immunization records car title, registration, and insurance documentation, cash and prepaid cash cards that cannot be traced. This is huge. You really need to start thinking about that. Get a prepaid cash credit card that cannot be traced. That's really important. Uh, prepaid cell phone or a cell phone with a new contract and number. Try to keep it fully charged. Current medications and prescriptions for yourself and your children clothing for yourself and your children, any keepsakes and a spare set of keys. So, um, you know, given that we are dealing with natural disasters, now would be a great time to get that together and not be under suspicion. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm just thinking it would be a really good idea to, um, to get your go bag together. And you can say, Hey, this is an emergency go bag in case, you know, flyer, flood, whatever. So that's something to think about. So John, if you could pretty please, sweetheart, darling, post both of those lists. Oh, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one is a, an emergency go bag. Like you're going to need water. You're going to need food. You need this. The other one is the domestic violence go bag. You know, you're bugging out. You need to have all the important documentation, but now would be the perfect time to put it together because, you know, we've got hurricanes coming in, we've got fires, we've got floods, we've got, hey, earthquakes, whatever. So just say you're making a, a safety go bag for the, you know, floods and fires and this and that and the other thing. So like I said, hide things at the bottom, put them in the children's shoes, put socks on top of them, etc. So there is that. Or if you, the best thing, though, honestly, is to get it out of the house. If you can get it out of the house and save it over at a trusted friend's house, that's the best way to go. But if you can't, okay, well, it's an emergency go bag in case we have a natural disaster. So there's that. Okay, let's see here. Um, all right, so I wanted to dive into how to deal with strangers. So what I have been hearing from clients and from people contacting me online is that when they are confronted with somebody who is aggressive or rude or um, pushy or uh, inappropriate or whatever, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn kicks in. Well, this is to be expected because generally people who are rude, not all the time, but nine times out of 10, they have a disorder because healthy, normal people don't act like jack wagons. Okay, let's just be clear on that. Um, hold on just a second. So fight, flight, freeze, or fawn kicks in. Abusers, even strangers, are looking for that, okay? Uh, I can give you a couple of great personal examples. So not too long ago, I had a person contact me on email, and they were trying to sell me something. And I was like, no, thank you. Please stop sending me stuff. I'm not interested. Got an email back why? And I'm like, oh, hell no, we are not playing that game. So I blocked them. Well, then they got a different email and you didn't, you, you need to do that. You need to, you, and I'm like, mm, block, <laughs> no response, block. 
So they're counting on us responding as the age that we were when we were abused. Let me say that again. Scam artists, rude people, disordered jack wagons are counting on us to respond as our inner child. That's what they're looking for because children are easy to take advantage of. And people who take advantage of children deserve a special place in hell. If you want my personal opinion, whether it's an inner child or whether it's an actual child, they can go rotten hell as far as I am concerned. Don't get me started. I'm about to really go off on a tangent here. Anyway, the point being is, so you have to say no and mean it. Now, if this had been a few years ago, like 20 years ago, I probably would have started trying to explain to them why I didn't want their services. Now, I don't do that. Now I'm just like, oh, hell no, no is a complete sentence. If you don't respect that, you get that out of my space. You know what I'm saying? So there was that instance. Then, and I posted this on, on my Facebook page, we had this con artist from supposedly SRP that shows up at the door. We were expecting my nephew to come over. And so that's why I answered the door. Otherwise, I wouldn't answer the door. So the guy rings the doorbell. I answer the door expecting it to be Eli. No, it was not Eli. It was this guy scruffily dressed with this, you know, uh, oh, what are those things called? Notepad or the, you know, thing that you can write on that kind of thing. And he says, oh, I'm here from SRP. I need to get into your house so I can give you a survey. No. I looked at him and I said, where's your badge? And he said, what badge? And I'm like, if you work for SRP, every single employee has a badge with an ID and a photograph. Uh, or, uh, or, well, I don't work for SRP. I work for a third party. No, you don't. Slam the door in his face. Two seconds later, I'm not even kidding you, Eli shows up at the door. So <laughs> he's like, what was up with that guy? And I'm like, oh, he's a scam artist, you know? So um, anyway, oh. Thank you. Thank you. I look pretty in these colors. Thank you. Purple is my favorite color. So um, anyway, so that that kind of, you know, and the guy was obviously not together. But then that makes me nervous because does that mean now that they're going to be smart enough to go fake a badge from SRP? So that that bothers me. So if somebody shows up to your door and claims to be from a utility company a whatever, even if they show you a badge, you call the company first and say, hey, let me get the company on the phone to make sure you are who you say you are, you know? And then nine times out of 10, they'll, uh, you know, and then leave because they're not. So anyway, they are counting on intimidating that inner child. So that's why people are rude. That is why people are aggressive. That is why people are, you know, that are disordered, do what they do. So I wanted to read this article, 10 Pet Peeves driven by trauma. So childhood trauma. This is on Psychology Today. This is by Katie Gillis. Um, all right. So 10 pet peeves driven by trauma. And so why we react the way we do to rude people. Being cut off in traffic or a line can trigger the wound of being pushed aside like you do not matter and are not valued or seen. That is very true. So rude people have a sense of entitlement. Gee, who else has a sense of entitlement? That would be narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines if they're malignant. And so they feel that they deserve to cut in front of you. Okay. This has been happening a lot, apparently, at Disney. So what do you do when something like that happens? I would go get a cast member. I really would. I would speak to a cast member. It's really not your job. And if you're dealing with somebody who is that disordered that they're going to blatantly break the rules and they're going to blatantly, you know, thumb their nose at you, they may be unbalanced enough to start something physical. So go get a cast member. That would be the best solution. As far as road rage is concerned, I'm going to cover that in just a second. Nine times out of 10, the road ragers are completely insane. So I just had one recently where the guy cut the guy cut the woman off she didn't know what she did wrong right she was like what did i do you know she just you know she didn't pull out in front of anybody she didn't cut anybody off she didn't do anything but the guy for some reason had it out for her. so he boxed her in a stoplight got out of the car walked over and punched her mirror and broke it 
because he was that much rage. So crazy. Hello. So what do you do in that instance? You get your phone out and you dial 911. People are so terrified of calling 911 because it's like, oh, well, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to be a burden. Ooh, what does that sound like? That sounds like our inner child again. So here's the deal. If you feel like you are being intimidated by somebody, grab your phone, take pictures. So one time I was at a stoplight and this guy in a pick -em up truck decided he was pissed off at the motorcyclist who had done nothing. I mean, we'd been driving along Higley Road and, you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. It's just this guy decided that he needed to have his testosterone up in, you know, the outer atmosphere. Anyway, same thing. He got out of the car and started to try to start something with the motorcyclist. So I started honking my horn and taking pictures because it was like, mm, I'm not going to let you get away with this. You know, and then he flipped me off and got back into his car and I'm like, bring it. I will have the cops all over your ass. So, you know, it just, they're crazy. They're crazy. And it's not us. I want to be 110% clear. When somebody behaves outrageously, when somebody does the intimidation, remember, abusers, no matter who they are, strangers, friends, family, lovers, whatever, fear. They deal in fear. They want to get your inner child riled up so you don't do anything. So they deal in intimidation. So fear, intimidation. If that doesn't work, obligation, that's usually if you know them, and guilt, obviously, if you know them. But these strangers, they deal in intimidation. We do not negotiate with terrorists. That's all I got to say to that. It's like, uh-uh. You know what? If I didn't put up with that doo-doo from my father, I'm sure is not going to put up with it from a total stranger. Absa, freaking lutely not. So it's a matter of working on our childhood traumas and getting those nailed down so that when that fear pops up and we recognize it, we're not terrified. We're not sitting there in flight, fight, freeze, fawn. We're in action. That's what we need to be in. We need to be in action. What is the next right step? Okay, I got to call 911. Okay, where's the nearest cross street? You know, that was the next thing. I was like, okay, where's the nearest cross street? Where am I? You know, that kind of thing. It's really important to be aware of your surroundings if you're dealing with a road rage thing. Okay. Um, all right. Yes, they do absolutely get off on throwing off the victim, the, the target of their abuse. Intimidation makes them feel powerful. That is their kokanya. They absolutely get off on seeing the fear in the victim's eyes. And if somebody doesn't have fear in their eyes, they stop. If you will notice, I started taking pictures, honking the horn. You know, he starts flipping me off. I'm like, bring it. Bring it. Nobody's going to let you beat up an old lady. Sorry. So anyway, it just because there were other people around, too, that were also like, uh-uh. So anyway, ugh, that's there's that. Okay. So back to the pet peeves driven by childhood trauma. Uh, being interrupted can trigger the wound of being talked over by caregivers and treated like our words do not matter. So when we're dealing with, say, for example, we have to deal with something that's gone wrong and we have to deal with a government person or we have to deal with a bank or we have to deal with whatever. If they start interrupting you, you have my permission to go, ah, uh -uh. you are going to let me finish. Seriously. Because they're counting on overwhelming you with their their BS. That's what they're trying to do. So when I have people that do that, I stop them cold. I do not allow people to interrupt me. It's like, uh-uh, we're not doing that. That is not okay. So either you shut up and you let me finish or you get your manager. And I hate to sound like a Karen, but in some instances, you're going to have to. Because these abusers, and that's abusive, by the way. Let me just let me just be clear about that. When somebody is in uh, an industry where they're supposed to be helping someone and they're talking over them, that's not okay. That is absolutely not okay. So anyway, there is that. All right. So getting back to 10 pet peeves. Um and, and again, it's recognizing that you have the right to your voice. So if you've been in situations where somebody has been rude 
and interrupted you and talked over you, you have a right to your voice, especially if you're there to get something done that they've done wrong. So it's really important to work on self-esteem. The Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Write those angry letters to the abusers who talked over you, who intimidated you with fear. My dad used to do that because he was huge. He was six foot five and he had hands like frying pans and he would beat the crap out of us every time he felt like it. So, you know, write and burn angry letters. It's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you don't get to do this to me anymore and neither does anybody else. And that is your mantra. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has the right to abuse you. Nobody. And I don't give a flying rat's ass who they think they are. Because they think they're important. Because they think they can. Because, oh, you look so sweet and kind. I bet I can push you around. Oh, test me, mother clucker. And that's exactly it. It's like they think they can push people around. But then when you really show your gumption, they back off. So, so work on boundaries. What will you not put up with from any body? And these should all be absolute ironclad. Nobody is going to intimidate me. Nobody is going to talk over me. Nobody is going to try to push their way into my house. Nobody is going to, do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah. Okay. Back to the pet peeves. All right. Um, all right. So eating a meal with somebody who is on their phone can again, trigger the wound of being ignored. This I see a lot in relationships. And that's a, that's kind of a red flag. So really, this is something that needs to be talked about. It's kind of like, okay, are we going to have phones out when we're at home? Now, what I recommend is that when you're at home, and you've been out busy all day and everything else, the phones get turned off, put into a basket, and you have quiet time together to talk to each other. I find it really sad that some families will actually text each other from the top floor to the bottom floor, as opposed to actually talking to each other. So it's important to have face-to-face -face time because that's intimate. So oftentimes when people are buried in their phone, it's because they're afraid of being intimate. So that's not okay. That's a disrespect. That is, that is a disrespect. It is. So if you're with somebody and you're in a meal with them and they're buried in their phone, unless they're on call and they're dealing with an emergency, and even at that, that's kind of iffy, it's like, um, excuse me, put your damn phone down, turn it the freak off. Do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah. And it needs to be talked about. It's like, what's the rules as far as, as phone behavior is concerned? Um, waiting. Waiting in line can trigger the wound of not knowing if needs will be met. Now, I know that a lot of us have a huge amount of impatience. We do. It's like, ugh, what the, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of normal for having been abused. It is. So really the way to work on that is you just breathe. You're going to get there. Yes, you're having to wait. Yes, this sucks. Breathe. It's okay. We are safe. We are okay. Everything's fine. There's no saber-toothed tiger. It's self-soothing. It's self-soothing because it does bring up that feeling of, oh my God, I'm being lied to. I'm never going to get this. So this is something that abusers do a lot to their kids is they lie to them. They freaking lie to them. Oh yeah, we're going to do this. And oh yeah, you're going to get that. And, oh, do, 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 do. and then they never do. And the kid is sitting there with these expectations and that never happens. So that's where that fear of waiting comes from. And it's, it's kind of like you have to soothe yourself and go, hey, not everybody is my dad. Not everybody is my mom. Not everybody is my normal. Everything's fine. So yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, being put on the spot can trigger the wound of being in trouble. And this is where intimidators really try to get us. So you know, they'll try to uh, rush you into a decision. Car salesmen come to mind. Um, they'll try to rush you into a decision. They'll try to push for an answer right now, whoever they are. So you have the right to be like, I will give you an answer in 24 hours. And we're done, you know. So practice not answering immediately. The biggest thing I see people getting into trouble with, with their ex or with an abusive family, or with scam artists, 
is that they try to push them into giving an answer immediately. You know, the abusers are the ones that overflow with texts. You know, why haven't you answered me? Why haven't you answered me? Why haven't Stop. Jesus H. Montgomery, I'm not answering you for 24 freaking hours. And if you text me one more time, I'm not answering you ever. You know, seriously. It's like, uh-uh, not playing this game. I owe you nothing. Goose egg, zip, zero, zilch, nada, middle finger. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, you've got to practice not responding immediately. And this is something that we were trained to do as kids. How many times did our abuser looking to abuse, whether that was a parent or a, a romantic partner or a boss or a coworker or whatever, put us on the spot and make us feel like we were in trouble? How many times did that happen? I know for me, it happened a lot. So we've got to get into the, the point of, okay, little one, you're not in trouble. You are absolutely not in trouble. And this jack wagon has absolutely no right to put you on the spot. And you can even say that. He said, don't put me on the spot. Mm -mm. I'm not playing this game. Flip it around on them. If they can flip it around on us, we can flip it around on them. They can go suck an egg as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Here we go. Back to 10 pet peeves. Okay. One uppers can trigger the wound of being dismissed. So a one up experience. So let's say, you know, you did really well in this certain class and you were very proud of yourself and you go to tell somebody about it and suddenly they're telling you how much better they did or what a better class they had. It one up it, one up, one up. And so it's like never good enough, never good enough. And so with people like that, that's a huge red flag. That is a huge red flag. When somebody's a one upper, instead of them being happy for you. So for example, if somebody tells me something great that they've done, I'm thrilled. This is a good thing. This is, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so happy that this happened to you. This is good, right? With a one upper, it's like, oh, I'm going to show you how I'm better. And that's where you should be going. Why am I hanging around this person? Why am I hanging around this person? What is, what is up with that? So take a look at that. Who does this one upper remind you of? Because again, the inner child is the one that looks outside and tries to recreate relationships with the person that we had the hardest time with. But it never works out because it's always half of a doo-doo sandwich, half of a doo-doo sandwich, total doo-doo sandwich, whether that's a friendship, a boss, a coworker, a romantic partner, whatever. So watch out for the one uppers. Okay. Um, being lied to absolutely can, tr can trigger the wound of being unable to trust. And that goes back to a lot of the other things we talked about. Passive aggressive behavior can trigger wounds from experience in childhood. For those of us who grew up in homes with caregivers who behaved in a passive aggressive way, experiencing the same in adulthood takes us back to that feeling of being a small child, being unable to express their discomfort with the environment. So snarkiness, snarkiness is a passive aggressive behavior talking about somebody while they're standing right there and expecting them not to comment on it is a passive aggressive behavior so basically you call it out and you do not hang out with those people if they are snarky if they are catty you know if they are one uppers if they are uh you know talking about people gossipers those are all huge, ginormous red flags that are starting to look like the Communist Party. I'm not even kidding you. So you want to avoid those people. If they're snarky, if they're talking about people behind their backs, you can bet they're talking about you when you're not there. Does that make sense? So passive aggressive is there. How do I explain this? People who are passive aggressive are cowards. Let me just call it for what it is. They're cowards. They're unwilling to come straight out and go, I'm unhappy with this. I want this to change. This is a problem. And instead, they do these passive aggressive, drop hints the size of planets and expect people to pick up on it. And when they don't, they punish them. That is not how human nature works. That is not how communication works. That is not how healthy communication works works. Let us be clear. So in healthy communications, if something is wrong, you point blank, call it out. This is a problem. This needs to change. Here's what I'd like to see. Are you willing to work with me on this? And if they're not, you tell them goodbye. So passive aggressive comes from a place of coward. They're cowards. They're absolute cowards. And they're shocked when you call them out on it. So I had family members that would do that. They would talk about me and I'd be standing right there. And I finally just went, I'm right here. 
I can hear you. If you have something to say, you come and say it to my face. Oh, well, uh, and then they would backpedal and leave. And I'm like, good. Bye-bye. So, yeah, you don't put, we do not tolerate terrorists. They're terrorists. They're trying to make you feel less than. Being teased can trigger the wound of having boundaries violated. Absolutely. And there's a difference between gentle teasing and just mean. So mean teasing is sadistic. It's cruel. It's with the intention of harming and hurting. So you want to get rid of those people. You do not want them anywhere near you. And they love, abusers love to hide behind, oh, I was just teasing. Oh, I was just kidding. Uh-uh. Things said in jest are very often meant, especially if they're cruel. You know, if it's just gentle teasing, that's that's a little different. But if it's like it hurts you and they know it hurts you and you've told them that hurts you and they do it again, uh-uh. They can hit the road, Jack, and they can come back no more. You know what I'm saying? So that's what you want to do. All right. Um, okay. So that was the 10 pet peeves that are based in tra childhood trauma. Uh, okay, T nine ways to handle rudeness. So when people are no boundaries, they ask inappropriate questions, like especially about fertility, especially about having children or not having children, you know? Um, so there's a couple of ways you can handle questions that are inappropriate. And this is usually with family, not always, it could be with strangers, but you could bypass it. Um, you could say something like, thank you for asking. I have no answer as yet, which is way nicer than what I would be. Um, the thing that I do is when somebody asks me an absolutely inappropriate question, I just go, wow, thanks for asking. I'll literally make that face. And if they don't pick it up at that point, I will point blank say that is inappropriate and I am not answering that. And then if they do the, but why, but why, but why? No is a complete sentence. And then I'll walk away. So you've got to start standing up to these bozos. You really do. Because again, intimidation, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to intimidate. Okay. Um, you could reply with a question. Uh, so like, say, for example, someone asks you again, an inappropriate question. You ask them an inappropriate question. You could do that. I don't believe in playing games. I would simply say that's inappropriate. I'm not answering it. You could change the subject. So when somebody asks an inappropriate question and they're not getting it, I'll be like, hey, how about them Dodgers? And if they still don't get it, I leave. Um, okay, you could return the question. You could script the exchange. Um, so in other words, you kind of let them know that it's inappropriate and what you expect from them. So sometimes I see people do something along the lines of if somebody's inappropriate and asking, well, when are you going to have babies? You know, um, they'll say something like, you know, stress causes a lot of problems with infertility and constantly being asked about it is very stressful. So again, you're kind of letting them know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there is that. Although again, I am always for the direct route. I am always like, that's inappropriate. I'm not going to answer that. Um, okay. Uh, you could also, uh, feign that you don't understand. So that's often what I do when I have to be on the stand. I don't understand the question. Can you please reframe it? You know, it's like, you just play dumb. Okay. So this one is 10 things to know about road rage. All right. Road rage has absolutely nothing nine times out of 10 to do with the target of the road rage. Isn't that interesting? Now, Here's the deal. Sometimes people do stupid things. Sometimes they pull out in front of people. Sometimes they cut people off. Sometimes, a lot, here in Phoenix, they don't use their turn signal. Don't understand that one. It's like we're all supposed to be psychic and just, oh, they're going to get into my lane now. No. So they don't use their turn signal. It just, that drives me crazy. So being, <laughs> being upset at somebody doing that is normal. I just want to be clear with that. There are multiple times when I have to drive that I will comment on other people's driving skills or lack thereof, you know, but you don't want to get into a, a pissing match with a skunk. Let's just be clear. Because remember, a lot of those skunks out there are cuckoo for cocoa puffs and they're dangerous. So, um, all right. 
Uh, road rage. Uh, okay. High anger drivers engage in dangerous behaviors such as hitting or nearly hitting other vehicles, speeding, swerving through lanes, tailgating, and running red lights. They scream, swear, um, honk the horn incessantly. You just want to avoid those people. You cannot make that a better situation. High anger drivers experience more anger throughout the day as well. They are usually abusers. I hate to break it. Um, they have stress at home. Uh, they enter the car angry and they express this anger by acting impulsively on the road. High anger drivers report near more near accidents and more speeding tickets, which is not surprising. Um, the intensity of the aggression responses hinges on perception. A greater response can be elicited if the high anger driver feels that the others are deliberately aggressive with resulting retaliation felt as justified. So like the guy that got out and punched the woman's uh, rear view mirror or the guy that got out of his truck and tried to take on a, a motorcyclist who had a helmet on, don't know what he thought he was going to punch. Um, so yeah, uh, they feel justified. They feel it's in, they're entitled to their anger. Hmm, who does that sound like? Um, yeah. So it, you, you road rage people are crazy. What to do if you are a victim of road rage, stay calm. If you become a victim of road rage to someone else, you may want to stay calm. It might look like a dumb move, but trust me, it will save you a lot of trouble. Place a phone close to your ear or dial 911 so that they can see it. Uh, you may not be talking to anyone on the phone, but the aggressive driver might think you are calling the cops. Better yet, contact the cops to alert them to what's happening, but remain focused on the road. Retain crucial information. So if you can, take a picture of the license plate, memorize the license plate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do not get out of the car. Don't. Don't roll down the window. Nothing. When facing road rage, your car is the best possible protection. You should lock the windows and do not allow anyone to get close. Do not risk getting out of the car as the other person might hit you either physically or with their vehicle. Do not go home. My suggestion would be to drive to your nearest police station or fire station because there's usually a, a police car there too. So if, if there's no police station near, drive to a fire station. Absolutely. And come in hot, honking the horn and everything. So um, yeah, you want to be very, very, very careful with those people. Uh, get off the freeway. If you're on the freeway during a road rage, get off. And if you're not on the freeway, you may want to get on. Just like you, the angry driver was moving to a destination. Getting on or off the freeway affects the person and they may back off. Or they may not, because if they are really, truly crazy, they will follow you miles out of their destination because they're that angry. So remember, when you're dealing with somebody who is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, their rage knows no depth. It, it's, it's infinite. And they will go for miles. They will. So you've got to be careful and be prepared to call 911. Um, okay. If you realize someone is harassing you, you may stop the car. Often the individual will stop. Uh, to try to escalate the road rage, that's the time to take off and leave them there. Or once they see you stop, they might reconsider and speed off themselves. I don't know if that's such a great one. Draw attention to yourself. Uh, flash your lights, honk the horn, do anything you can to attack att the attention of other people. Onlookers may call the police, probably not. Call the police yourself. Um, it's always good to avoid being the cause of road rage. Protect yourself from other people's furies and know what to do if you are the victim of road rage. So there is that. All right. One last one and we'll get to the questions. Uh, what to do with how to handle hostile and confrontational people. Stay safe. The most important priority in the face of a confrontation with hostile individuals is to protect yourself. If you don't feel comfortable with a situation, leave. 110%. You are under no obligation to sit there and take abuse from anybody. And I don't care who the frick they think they are. Seek help and support. Contact law enforcement if you have to. Should you decide to deal with the aggressor, consider the following skills and strategies. Keep your distance and your options open. Not all confrontational and hostile individuals are worth tasseling with. Your time is valuable and your happiness and your well-being are important. So here's where I see people getting into trouble. So that very young sense of justice. Well, this isn't fair. I'm going to make them see. I'm going to get them to understand. No, you're not. You know why? They're crazy. 
They are the big cray cray. I cannot emphasize that enough. They are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. There is no there there. If there was a there there, they wouldn't be jack wagons. Does that make sense? So the sense of injustice and I'm going to make them see and I'm going to get them to see it and da da da. Stop. Just freaking stop. They're never going to get it. Stop. Just stop. Seriously. The only time you want to engage is if it has to do with the well-being of your child and only through email, our family wizard, or text so that you can show that they're a lying sack of doo-doo. You do not want to do phone calls. You do not want to do anything that could possibly be filmed or edited so that you look like you're the aggressor. So absolutely not. Stop. Get your inner child in checked. The Inner Child Workbook, Catherine Taylor, uh, Recovering Your Inner Child by Lucia Cappuccioni. Both of those are great books. Get them, work them, do it. One is experiential, one is more cerebral. So whichever one works for you, get it and work it. Because the person that's continually engaging with the ex or engaging with an aggressor or engaging with somebody who's absolutely bat shimomo crazy, that's not the adult you. Let me just say that again. That is not the adult you. An adult would look at that situation and go, you cray cray, I'm out of here, bye. You know, and you can just do on your own petard. Thank you very much. So, but the inner child is the one that goes, but, 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 and you've got to be like, girl or guy, mm -mm, we're not playing that game. They're crazy. They're never going to get it. Me engaging with them is only giving them more ammunition. Stop. Stop. So there is that. Okay. Um, keep your cool and avoid escalation. One of the most common characteristics of confrontational and hostile individuals is that they project their aggression to push your buttons and keep you off balance. By doing so, they create an advantage from which they can exploit your weakness, which is fight, flight, freeze, or one, because you're now your inner two-year-old or four-year-old or 10-year-old or 12-year-old. If you are required to deal with a difficult individual, the most important rule of thumb is to keep your cool. The less reactive you are, to provocations, the more you can use your better judgment to handle the situation. Gray rock. So no matter what they say, no matter what they do, you give them nothing. I got nothing here. You know, you give them nothing because they're looking for that terror. They're looking for that fear. They're looking for that anger, that sadness. Your tears are delicious to them. They are Every four-lettered word I cannot say. They are. And they get off because they're sadists on your fear, your sadness, your anger, whatever. It makes them feel powerful. If you give them nothing, they stop because it's not fun. It's not fun for them. They're bullies. They're bullies. Okay. Um, okay. If you feel upset with or challenged by someone before you say or do something you might later regret, take a deep breath. <sighs> And think about what you're going to say. Realize that nine times out of 10, whatever you're going to say is not going to make a bit of difference. So what you might want to do is, this is not a good time. We'll talk later. Oh, they hate that because now the power is out of their control. Um, they, have no, they have no control over you. This is not a good time. I'm not willing to deal with this right now. We'll deal with it later. They're not going to like it. Oh, well. Depersonalize and shift from reactive to proactive. Being mindful about the nature of confrontational and hostile in people can help us depersonalize the situation and turn from being reactive to proactive. One effective way to depersonalize is to put yourself in the other person's shoes, if even just for a moment. Consider the offender you're dealing with and the complete sentence, it must not be easy. Eh, you could do that, but you also have to realize you don't want to be too empathic with them. So what you what I like to do is I like to remind myself this person's anger is not mine. So it reminds me of the Buddhist story where the angry man sought out Buddha and you know railed at him and how dare you and da 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 and Buddha just kind of went, okay, cool. Um, what do you do when somebody gives you a gift you don't want? Oh, I refuse it. I am refusing your gift of anger. You can take that back home to your family. Bye. It's the same thing. You don't accept emotions that are not yours. You're not responsible for that person's anger or unhappiness or sadness. Now that has to do with codependency. 
So you want to work on that codependent part. You want to work on the diseased please, Harriet Breaker, or any book on codependency. Their emotions are not your problem to make better because guess what? They are always going to be angry. They are always going to be upset. They are always going to be unhappy because that is who they are. And you cannot fix that. So yes, rage does release endorphins. That's why if you've ever gone to an AA meeting with the old dry drunks, <laughs> they're pissed as hell and they're angry all the time because they're getting their endorphins jacked up because they're used to having the endorphins from the alcohol and the drugs. Now they can't have it. So now they're angry all the time. Yes. Anger does increase the endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, et cetera. So that's why, that's why they do it. It's another addiction for another narcissist. All right. Um, so your fundamental rights, you have the right to be treated with respect. You have the right to express your feelings, opinions, and wants. You have the right to set your own priorities. You have the right to say no without feeling guilty. You have the right to get what you paid for. You have the right to have opinions different from others. You have the right to take care of and protect yourself from being threatened physically, mentally, or emotionally. You have the right to create your own happy and healthy life. So there is that. That is basically, in a nutshell, why we get so ramped up by abusers or by strangers, because they're... <laughs> It's almost like they're psychic. They go for the jugular. They, they go for that. How can I get to that little kid inside? Seriously. So when they try intimidation, fear, whatever, it, you owe them nothing. And you want to get that inner child handled so that when you're out in the world and one of these jack wagons come at you, you can be like, nope, not playing. You could just go to hell. You know what I'm saying? And not feel guilty about it. That's the other thing they'll try to do is that once they see the intimidation doesn't work, they'll flip and they'll be like sob story or guilt trying to make you feel guilty. Uh-uh. I don't do guilt anymore. Thank you. I didn't put up with it from my family and I'm sure as hell not putting it up with it from you. Do you see where I'm going with that? So you got to get used to saying no and meaning it. All right, let's dive into the questions because I really went long on that one. Can I control my verbal physical responses. Oh, I can control my verbal physical responses, but my body in face of stress still has an immediate reaction. Sweat profusely. I stink like a stress induced, in, wait, a stress induced turtle tank. Do I just breathe when I'm being or perceived to be attacked? How do you calm yourself? Yeah. Breathing is your friend. So remember when a threat comes in, the amygdala cannot tell the difference between a real threat an imagined threat, an emotional threat, whatever. It's all the same. So the best thing you can do is to breathe. Why? Because the amygdala freaks out, tells the hippocampus hypothalamus, oh my God, we're in danger, right? So now we're starting to tense up and that's when we start sweating, okay? Because the cortisol is being released through the body. So then the next step is, is that then these two guys are like, oh my God, okay, we got the cortisol. Oh my God, oh my God. So now we're not breathing, right? No oxygen, CO2 flow. That tells another part of the brain that's a little further down on the brain stem. Oh my God, we're going to die. There's no oxygen. That tells the adrenal gland to release all of the adrenaline at once. So now we're shaking like a leaf, sweating. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then we either go into a panic attack or a rage attack. One of the two. So your best bet is to breathe. Absolutely. Be aware of, are you holding your breath? Because we do. When we're faced with a threat, we have a tendency to go, <gasps> and we hold our breath. So you want to breathe. You want to breathe. So, and the best thing to do is continue to breathe, even in the face of somebody being in your face, screaming at you. Now, when I worked at the homeless shelter, I had drug addicts, alcoholics, et cetera, get in my face and try to intimidate me. And I would just, in the on the inside, I was freaking the frick out. I was. But on the outside, calm, cool, collected. Are you done? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm sit your ass down. Yeah. No response. No fear. They were looking for fear. They were looking for fear. So you breathe. You just breathe. Your body is going to respond. Okay. It is. It absolutely is. You've got to master that. You've got to be able to breathe, keep that gray rock going and not see them, not let them see you freak out. 
As soon as that incident was over and I was done with the class and got them out of the room, I turned to my partner and I literally broke down because it was terrifying because I was fully expecting to get shanked or hit or spit at or something. So you know what I'm saying? So you've got to work on concealing that fear because that's what they get off on. That's what they get off on. So there is that. Um, you breathe. You just breathe. Can you please give advice on how to deal with the snarky type of women gossiping as you stand right there and try to stay calm? You leave. You just leave. If they're coworkers, you just leave. If they're not, you know, if they're snarky and they're nasty and they're, you know, passive aggressive and they're talking about you, you can do a couple of things. You could confront them, which is probably what I would do because I genuinely don't give a flying rat's ass. So, you know, and I would confront them. But if they're not anybody important to you, if they're, if they're, or even if they are somebody important to you, I would confront them. But if they're coworkers and there's somebody that you have to get along with, you walk away. What does it matter? Let them. They're trying to find a scapegoat. Don't be it. Walk away. Don't participate. Don't have lunch with them. Don't hang out with them. Don't, you know, don't socialize with them. You might want to look for a different job if that's the case. So, like I said, I had family members that would try that and I just confronted them. I was, and I stood my ground. I was like, you leave. <laughs> this is my area. You leave. So yeah, you've got, you kind of got to work on the polar opposite of how we were trained by our abusers. It sucks and it's not fair and it's not, that's the word I'm looking for. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I, I wish in a perfect world, oh my God, I'm going to cry. In a perfect world, none of us would have had to go through this. In a perfect world, there wouldn't be these snarky, nasty women or men or whatever. It wouldn't be acceptable. But in this world, oh my God, we've made it acceptable. And it's not. It's not acceptable. And I encourage each one of you to not accept it and to not put up with it. And to not allow these people to ruin this gorgeous planet. Because they are. So, yeah. That's that's my thing. <sighs> okay. Let's see. Um, can you address how to handle family members who like to publicly bring up your past mistakes at family gatherings? I don't go. I just don't go. They're looking for a scapegoat. They're looking for... It's one-upping. So it's kind of like, let me embarrass you in front of all these people. My dad used to do that all the damn time. And I finally got to the point where I was like, uh, you know what? I'm going to move a thousand miles away so I don't have to deal with this. And I did. You know, it's like I got as far away from him as I possibly could. There was no reason for me to go home. It was done. So, you know, unless there's family members you want to see, and even at that, I would go do them on your own terms, on your own time. Um, I wouldn't even go. I wouldn't even go. I would, that does not sound healthy to me. So I wouldn't even go. Don't even go to the family reunion. If they bring stuff up, you could confront them, but they're looking for a fight. You got to understand they're looking for the drama. They're looking for the, uh, the chaos. Don't give it to them. Just don't go. Just don't go. If there's family members you want to see, go see them on your own terms. 100%. Don't give them a chance to bring up embarrassing stuff. So, yeah, that would be my advice. Uh, okay. All right. All right. I think that's it. All right, you guys. Um, have a great week. Let me see what I am talking about next week because I forgot to look it up because wasn't thinking. Okay. Hold on. August shows. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, oh, okay. On the 27th, we're going to be dealing with hoarding too much stuff. We're going to talk about hoarding. So on the 26th, I want to remind you guys, I'm going to be in Salt Lake City. I will see you guys in Salt Lake City. There are still tickets available for Salt Lake City at chrisgodinas.com. <coughs> so if you are interested in coming to the meet and greet, uh, at Salt Lake City, go to chrisgodinas.com. The tickets are available. Uh, I will be there on the 26th. And then on the 27th, we will be talking about hoarding and why that is a trauma response. So we're going to deal with that. All right, my loves, you guys go be awesome. Have a great week. Drink plenty of water. Get your go bag together.
because there's lots of natural disasters. I just think it's a smart idea to have a go bag regardless. And then, of course, you can always use the excuse that, oh, this is the family go bag. And it's not. So anyway, there that is. All right, you guys, be safe. And I will talk to you next week. I'll talk to you on Wednesday. <laughs> Bye.